Philippians chapter 4 and verse 7. Philippians 4 and verse 7. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding shall keep your hearts, your minds through Christ Jesus. May the Lord add his blessings in our hearts as we come together to worship him in spirit and in truth. Let us kneel together in prayer as we invite the Lord's presence here with us this morning. We humbly bow before you, dear Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. We thank you for this opportunity of coming here before you in freedom. Dear Lord, we commit this hour to you as we open your word and uh, reflect upon uh, not just your goodness toward us, but what is required of us as your children. We ask for your blessings. We ask for your Holy Spirit and clearness of mind. I ask forgiveness for our sins and trespasses as we come before you. Dear Lord, we, we, we think at this time those who are not able to be here for whatever reasons, those throughout Australia, throughout the globe, not able to meet in your house of prayer, but are, meet, are meeting because of circumstances in their homes, be by their side and encourage them as they to reflect upon your word. We commit our lives to you at this time and pray that uh, your will may be done in our lives. I pray the Lord for the younger ones as they to have come to worship you, to listen to your word. Help them, Father, to understand your will better for them. I commit these things to you and ask them in the name of Jesus. Amen. This morning as we uh, focus a little bit on this, uh, you know, whenever we meet here together, we, we consider the Word of God. It is only a short time that we have here together. So what we receive here is, 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 is not much, really. But I pray that as we, this morning, consider a few verses together and, and, and uh, look at this, this, this topic we may be encouraged to understand better the will of God for you and for me. We read in uh, Philippians 4 verse 7, And the peace of God which surpasses all Understanding shall keep your hearts, your minds through Christ Jesus. Has this been our experience? And as we look back to the lives of those before us, those we call, that comes out in, the, in Scripture as the disciples of Christ, was this experience? Absolutely. They went through fire. They went through some terrible experiences, and yet they had the peace of God in their hearts. And nothing could move them. Do we have this? The word disciple is found in, in the Bible only way. In the Gospels. In Acts. Okay. What does it mean to be a disciple? <coughs> what does it mean? I looked it up. And uh, two of the best definition I found was a pupil. A pupil or a student. Same thing. A student. Of someone making its teachings, 
his or her rule of life and conduct. That's what it means. And we read in uh, Matthew 10, 24. Let's turn to Matthew 10, verse 24. We read something very of, 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 of vital importance there. We read there that the disciple is not above, what? Not above his master. Okay? So the disciple has a master that he, lear- he or she learns from. He is not above his master. There is a recognition, an acknowledgement of servanthood. I repeat it. There is an acknowledgement of servanthood. Someone greater is above us. The disciple is not above his master, nor the servant above his Lord. And and again in Luke chapter 6, verse 40. Luke chapter 6, verse 40. The disciple is not above his master, but everyone that is perfect shall be as his master. What does that mean? Everyone, when he is completely trained, that's what it means. When he is completely trained, shall be like his master. Are you a disciple of Christ? Are we being trained under our master, Jesus? If this is our experience, then when we are fully trained, we shall be like Jesus, by God's grace. But there has to be an understanding that we are no greater than Christ. Christ is our Lord. And this understanding here refers to those who accept the teachings of anyone. You look, if you look in the world, those who are taught by a professor, their, their wish is to be like, as knowledgeable and able as him. Okay? Shall I be like his teacher? Okay? Not just in, especially when it comes to Christianity. Not just in belief, but also in practice, like Christ in practice. And the Bible tells us that some became John's, you know, Apostle John. Some became his disciples. There were others that became the disciples of Moses when Moses passed. But this term is most commonly used to those who who would follow after Christ. As we know. It is actually the only only name for Christ followers in the Bible. Disciples. We find in Acts that after the death an ascension of Christ. Disciples are those who confessed him as the Messiah. They were called, they were known as Christians. Christians. A person who has received Christ. Christians.
You know, there is a, a statement in uh, Christ Object Lesson. I have a story for the younger ones. It will be part of the meditation this morning, so listen carefully. All right. Um, now, if really indeed we have the experience of discipleship, all right, the Christian must not remain idle. We have a work to do. If we think we have accepted Christ as a personal Savior, now we can sit back and bask in the peace of Christ. That's not what it is. Christ Object Lesson, page 327. No more surely is... Do we believe that when Christ left, he says... What did he say? In my Father's house are many mansions... I go to prepare a place for you. Then what? If I go, I will come back to receive it to myself. Do we believe in this promise? Absolutely. No more surely is a place prepared for us in the heavenly mansions than is the special place designated on earth where we are to work for God. Just as this is real, this is also real, the work we are to do here. To work for God. We cannot separate the two. <coughs> Excuse me. What comes first? Being a Christian or being a disciple? <laughs> eh? what, what comes first? But the, younger, the younger minds there. The young ones at the back as well. What, what comes first? Discipleship or Christ, being a Christian? Eh? Yeah. Discipleship. Discipleship. You know, Christ's followers were called disciples way before they were called Christians. Okay? Their discipleship began with the call of Christ, with the call of Jesus. It required them to exercise their will to follow them, to follow him. You know, we read in Matthew 9, verse 9. Matthew chapter 9 and verse 9. And as Jesus passed forth from thence, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the receipt of custom. That simply means what? He was sitting, he was, a, he was a tax collector. So he was sitting in the tax booth. And he said, Christ said to him, follow me. And he arose and followed him. From his own will, by his own will. Christ, Christ never coerced him. He responded to Christ's appeal. If you remember, we were also asked to go make disciples. Those who accept Christ as a personal Savior. Have the experience of redemption. It says, go, make disciples of others. Baptizing them. I would like us this morning to look at four or five verses only to help us um, in a way where the Lord mentions some of the some of the things that are essential for true discipleship. 
And without these, a man cannot be his disciple. Okay? I'm sure it is our, our wish to be Christ's disciples. It is our wish. You know, it's easy to, it's easy to, to be a preacher's disciple. But it's a bit different to be Christ's disciple. So let us look at a few verses together. And may God help us. Um, <laughs> there's, one, there's one verse found in, uh, in Luke chapter 12, which, which, which uh, I think many have tripped over this in the past. Uh, not here, but uh, in growing up, I've heard many, many um, um, interpretations of this. It is found in Luke chapter 14, verse 26. Luke 14 and verse 26. Here we find, in Christ's word, If any man come to me, and hate not his brother, sorry, hate not his father, his mother, and wife, and children, brethren, and sisters. He says, yea. And his own self, his own life also, he cannot be my, what? Disciples. My, my disciple. So, these words prove that the first requirement of discipleship of Christ is... What did we see there? In a nutshell, wholeheartedness. Wholeheartedness. That's what it means. And as I said before, this verse has puzzled many people. Because they, they suppose, they suppose, or they have supposed that Christ really wished them to, to hate Father, mother, wife, sister, brothers. No. For to hate is to murder. So it cannot be that. We cannot hate and be a disciple of Jesus. It doesn't work like that. All Christ was saying here was wholeheartedness as we move forward, as we come to him. Okay? Christ's religion is a religion of love, not hate. I believe what Christ was saying here is, can, can be, there is a clue. There is a clue found in Luke chapter 14. What he's saying here is simply, simply that <coughs> him, Christ, he is to have the first place in our hearts. And all who are dear to us are to be second. And yes, we ourselves are to be last. You know, growing up, I'm sure we've all been through that, uh, little saying um, about joy. Spell joy. Jesus first, others next, you last. And that's what it means. It means wholeheartedness. We cannot be Christ's disciples if we, if we have I in the first place. No. Christ must have the first place. We must be prepared to break every earthly tie. Rather than the, the one that binds us to him. We must not break that. Earthly ones, yes. And in Luke 14, 33, we read there, So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh, not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. 
wholeheartedness. We must renounce, for, f- f- to forsake means to renounce, to, so, to surrender, to surrender. He's saying, if you, cannot, if you cannot give up everything you have, you cannot be my disciple. And as his followers, are we willing to put Christ first and us last? Christ, others, then last, us, us last. I'd like us to paint a picture here. In Luke chapter 14, verse 25. Luke 14, verse 25. Luke 14, 25. We see there large crowd were traveling with Jesus because of what? Remember? It says here, and there were great multitude with him. Large crowd traveling with him because they had seen him healing people. They had seen him feeding the hungry. They had seen him teaching the people. At no cost. At no cost. Ah, why not then follow him? Follow Jesus. We can get something for nothing, in a way. As it were. However, verse 25, we see Jesus turn a stop and turn around, telling them that following him is not without cost. Verse 25, and there, were, uh, and there went great multitudes with him. And he turned around and said to them, If anyone come after me, then he goes on. What they had to do. Have you added up the cost of following Christ? We need to add add up the cost. So number one is what? Wholeheartedness. Yeah, give up the rest To follow Jesus. Wholeheartedness. We cannot come on board following Christ half-half. He wants us fully. Holy. Another point I'd like to bring out is found in John chapter 8 verse 31. John 8 31. You know? You know, you know, sometimes I like I like to ask a question. When you come to God, can He fulfill all, your, all of your need? Can God fulfill all your need? All your expectation? Can He do that? Then why is it that someone who gives their life to God, they have this wonderful experience, then sadly sometimes they walk away? Have they not been filled? Do you know what I mean? Why walk away? Why lose that experience? The issue is not with God. The issue is with us. We read in uh, John 8, 31, Then said Jesus to those Jews which, which, which believed on Him. You know, we, last week with the Gerson shared the sermon, you know, we, you know, we saw. And, uh, Christians suffer. Christians suffer. And many have asked in the past, why do good people suffer? 
What did Christ say to, you know, to the um, rich young ruler? There is no one good, no? Not one. But yes, Christians do suffer. We read there, Then said Jesus to the Jews which believed on him, If, it's a big if there, if you continue in my word, then ye are my disciples indeed. That is a guarantee. We, we, we lose our experiences because we fail to, con to continue. We fail to abide and to, to hold on to the word of God. And that is not his fault, that is our fault. So it's important. Life throws a lot at, Christian, at everyone, but especially at Christians. So let us be dutiful in continuing in the word. Continuance is a trait that we need to have, that we must have. Continuance in his word is another trait of character, true discipleship, that you and I must have. Is this us? Is this our experience? Continuance. You know, everything else will pass away, but the Word abides forever. So may God give us the grace to continue in, in His Word. When we continue in His Word, we continue in, in obedience. And we can find that many in the Word of God, those before, before us, they went through afflictions, they went through fire, and they remained faithful because they trusted in the Word. They lived by the Word. Everything else will fail. You know, we look at the hymns we sing. Many of them are experiences written in the throes of, in the throes of affliction. They put pen to paper. And I was, I was, uh, let's say, um, I was reading about Thomas Dorsey last night. You know, there's an old song, old hymn, Precious Lord, Take My Hand, that he wrote. He didn't write this hymn while he was on high cloud. No. He was, he was low. But he hanged on to the word of God. Do you know who he was? Thomas Dorby. Dorsey. Thomas Dorsey. He was he an was, um, uh, American. Um, and uh, he loved, uh, he was in the jazz world. You know? And then he became to know of the gospel. And he accepted Christ. And his wife Nellie was, was pregnant one time. I goes back to, to uh, 1932. He was uh, only 30, 32 years old. Okay, a fairly new husband. He says his wife Nettie and I were living in a small apartment in Chicago. And uh, one hot August afternoon, he says I had to go to St. Louis, where I was uh, to be the feature soloist at a large revival meeting. And his wife was on the verge of giving birth. And that night, as, as, as you just about finished the revival, singing, he got a telegram, no, no fax in those days, or emails, or text messages. Hey, young people. <laughs> he got a telegram. And uh, all it read, um, that the crowd was calling, calling to sing again, so he kept singing. Then eventually he sat down, and a messenger boy came, and gave him an envelope, a telegram, and he read, he opened up, he read, your wife just died. And uh, he said, when I got back, I learned thy Nettie 
had given birth to a boy. He said, I swung, you can imagine, you know, newborn, newborn little one, your wife is dead. He said, I swung between grief and joy. Grief because of the death and joy because of this little thing. I swung between death and joy. Yet that night, what happened? The baby died. He said, I buried Nettie and a little boy together in the same casket. Then I fell apart. Four days, he closed him in a room and tried to reason God's purpose in all this. And a day after that, he, he found himself in another room with uh, one of his friend, Christian friend. And uh, he was so low that there was a piano there. And he began, he said, my fingers just went, went on the keys and the words came. And he composed this, this hymn, Precious Lord, Take My Hand. And if those who knows, knows the hymn, you can read it, you can see it now, maybe with a different understanding. That, that, that's where he was. But through all this, he understood that God was there for him. That as long as we live, this, live in this life, griefs and, and, and sadness and all these things will be there because the devil is there. Let us not give up in well-doing. By, by the grace of God. You know, a disciple can be forgiven if he lacks great mental ability or physical skills. But he cannot be excused if he does not have zeal. Zeal for the Lord. Zeal for souls whom Christ has died for. If our hearts is not aflame with a red hot passion for the Savior and souls Christ died for, we stand condemned. We stand condemned. Continuance in the Word of God. Let us remember to continue in His Word no matter what. Another essential tool for genuine dis di discipleship. John 13. John 13. John 13. Thirty-five. Jesus says there's, there's something, there is something the, world's need, the world needs to see. And when they see this, they will know that you are my disciple. What's that? Love one for another. First of all, love amongst disciples, brethren. Secondly, well, first of all, love for God, of course. Then amongst disciples, Brethren, then the world. Very important. You know, in Matthew 22, verse 37, let's turn to Matthew 22. Matthew 22 and verse 37. Matthew 22 and verse 37. Jesus said there that ye shall love, ye shall love the Lord thy God with all your heart, 
with all your soul, with all your mind. Verse 39, 38 tells us this is the first and great commandment. 39, and the second is like unto it, ye shall love your neighbor as yourself. Brother, love. We're commanded to do what? First of all, our allegiance is between us and God. Vertical. Right? If we have that, we're given then the basis for the horizontal. Is that right? Vertical. Love to God, then love to men. You know, we, especially in this, this time we live in, with many things happening, many ideas, many beliefs, we may not agree with we may, not, we may not agree with some, someone else's understanding of things or, 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 or conviction. You know? But we ask to love them, no matter what. We ask to love them. They may think differently to us. But Christ died for them as well. We ask to love them. And that is not something that we are born with. That is something that we receive through the re rebirth experience. To love our fellow men, no matter what. No matter what. What does it look like? What does love for others look like? We can look to Christ. Yes, and I appreciate that. You know, it is something that is born, that is born from above, not natural. You know, I was... I was I was, uh, we don't love when it's convenient only. Sometimes that's, that's, that's how we are, naturally. We love when it's convenient. We love when we're, we're going to get something back in return. That, that is not Christianity. That is not true discipleship. You know, I was reading about a story from, uh, um, George might know this, this place. Eh? This is a little place called Molokai Island, just out of Hawaii. Don't know if George has been there. <laughs> but I was reading about a story in relation to a man called Damien de Volster. He was a Belgian evangelist, missionary, rather, back in the days. And uh, Molokai was, well, was an island where they would send all the lepers. All the um, Hawaiian leper would go there. People with leprosy would go there, confined. You see, this man had an experience of redemption in, in his heart, in his life. And his, his brother was, was commissioned to go there, to work with these lepers. But he died. And Damien felt the call now. He loved his brother so much that he decided, no, this is my calling. I will go and work with these people. I've never met someone with leprosy, but I've, I've been told it's not a very pretty sight. You must stay away from them because of what? It's contagious nature, highly contagious nature. This man, Damien, he went there. He felt that was his calling. He went there, he, he fed them, he, he bathed them, he built them a chapel. He worshipped with them for such a long time. He was, one, he was one with them. And they loved him. He spent all his life and all his life savings there with these people. One Sunday morning, he got up, he was boiling some water, making himself a, a hot drink, and, and uh, the water swirled out and fell on his left foot. It took him a while to realize that I, didn't, I, I never felt that. He stunned. He was stunned. So he gently took some more water, boiling water, pour on his right, right foot. He didn't feel it. And he knew what had happened. What was it? He'd, he'd contracted leprosy as well. And that morning when he took the service, you know, he would normally start by, 
my, fe my, my fellow believers. This morning it started by saying my fellow lepers. And uh, meaning he, he counted himself as, as an outcast with them. Nevertheless, he, he, he made them realize that they were not lepers. They were people with leprosy. So he gave them the dignity of humanhood, of personhood. That's what Christians do. They give people the, the understanding that you know, you, you, you're a sinner, yes, but Christ died for you, for you. He values you. You are precious in God's sight. He made them say this, that you're not, you're not lepers as such, but you're, you're people with leprosy, with a disease. When he died, he was buried there on the island. And, and, and uh, a while later, the Belgian government wanted him back. Because he was a hero. You know? And the people pleaded. said, please don't take him back. He was one, one with us. He cared for us. They said, no, we, we want his body back. So they had to dig it up and send his body back. But the people said, look. Can you leave his hand here, his arm? He touched us. He fed us. So the government said, okay, let's, let's do that. So to, today in that grave on, on, on uh, Molokaya Island is not his body as such, but simply one hand that's been left there, the hand that touched the people, fed them, cared for them. And love your neighbors as you love yourself. We can only do this as we have Christ within us. As our hearts has been renewed through redemption. In fact, in James chapter 2 verse 16, another attribute here, James 2 verse 16, We are told here, how are we to love our brethren as ourselves? How are we to love every man as Christ's disciples? How? Love must be seen, not just spoken of. Not just lip service. And one of you shall say unto them, Depart in peace. Be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful to the body. What does it profit? You see what I mean? It's easy sometimes for us to say, Depart in peace. You know? But do we walk the mile? Do we walk the walk? If the love of God is a flame in our hearts, we will reach out to humanity and attend to their every need. God hates lip service. He will say, depart from me, I never knew you. What kind of Christianity is this if it's in word alone? Are there the poor, the poor among us, the needy, the sick, the discouraged ones, the hungry ones, the weak, the lonely, the brokenhearted? Where are we? If I may ask you, what is the, hey young people, what is the greatest blessings you've ever received? Hey? Scripture says that it is more blessed to give than to receive. And how true that is. You know, I was, just a short experience, I was uh, a, a while back, I was, I think, in Morley one, one Sunday morning, and uh, I was just got some money out of the bank, the ATM, and I was walking away. I noticed on the corner, on the floor, there was this, this mother and her son sleeping there. It was a cold morning, 
and they were scrambling to some bits and pieces to, f- to eat. And I thought, no, no. So I went down to Hungry Jack's and, and got them some breakfast and coffee and so on. And I went there um, and uh, went over to them. I said, please have this, this, for your, this as your breakfast. And they both, was, she was stunned. She touched her son who was on the side, coming in, 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 in a little bag. She said, oh, look, we have breakfast. And as I walked away, she says, God bless you. You know, God bless you. That is probably the greatest benediction I've ever, ever received. Ever received. So I, I, appeal to, I appeal to us all, to young people, doing service to humanity to bless others. And do it in the name of Jesus. Love for one another as you love yourself. Love for humanity. I would like to touch on the last point. Probably one of the most important characteristic is surrender. Surrender. We read in First Peter three fifteen. First Peter three fifteen. But sanctify the Lord God in your heart, in your hearts. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. What does that mean? Well, in a nutshell, it means, it means to love the Lord your God with all your heart. That's what it means. And your neighbor as yourself. Because if, dwell, if God dwells therein, then we will love our neighbors as, and as ourselves. Not natural for us, because we are naturally selfish. The heart of the faithful disciple is a dwelling place for God. It is to be a sacred place. Jesus enters our hearts as an invited guest when we invite him in willingly. He becomes our Lord and our King. You know, surrender is, if, we don't, if there is no surrender, then the rest goes out of the window. You know, when, when Christ was on earth, they were always asking questions to try and trip him, discredit him. And at this time, they came up to him and, and, and in, in, uh, in uh, Mark chapter 12, it also comes out in Matthew 22, but we look at Mark 12. They ask him, Mark 12 14 to 17, they ask him, is it lawful? Is it lawful to do what? To give tribute to Caesar. What does that mean? To give, sorry? Yeah, your taxes. Is it lawful? To give taxes to Caesar. Hmm. Shall we give or shall we not give? We read there, but he, knowing the hypocrisy, said unto them, Why tempt me? He asked now for a penny. He said, Bring me, bring me a penny. Bring me a penny. So they brought it to him. And he said unto them, What did he ask them? Whose image is on this penny? And they said unto him, Caesar's. And Christ, Jesus answering, said unto them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. What did Christ mean by that? Well, we, 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 you know, we, okay, we understand. 
taxes goes back to Caesar because his image, that, that belongs to him. Why did God, Christ use this analogy here? Give Caesar what belongs to Caesar and to God what belongs to God. Whose image is on that? Caesar's image. Give it back to him. But give to God what belongs to God. Ever, ever ask the question there? Well, the answer is found in Genesis chapter 1, last verse, 26. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. And God said, what? Let us make men into our, in our image after our likeness. What credential? And the question I ask is, whose image is on you? Brothers and sisters, young people. Whose image is on you? Render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. Whose image is on you? And that is one of the reasons why we don't believe in bloodshed. In taking a sword, a gun to kill someone else at war because we are violating the image of God. Whose image is on you? May God help us to not only render to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, but that we may have also the capacity to render unto God what belongs to him by creation and by redemption. Surrender. Unless we have those attributes, those experiences, we cannot be. Christ's disciples. May God help us to appreciate this. And may His Spirit don't give us rest until we understand and have that experience is my prayer. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Let us uh, kneel in prayer as we conclude our divine service.